uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. It's you know it's a different experience to see people as opposed to just uh, um, you know whatever whatever they show on the webinar. I think so. Um, I'm, thank you, thank you for coming, and thank you for showing your faces. And um, we're we're really excited about the um, this um, possibility, this option that that has landed in our laps. We, you know, we, ever since we've um, been uh, a thing um almost ever, ever since then we, people have been asking us about opportunities to visit um the eji museum and memorial in alabama and um uh you know we're a small group and we're uh, an all-volunteer organization and so it's you know it's been difficult for us to kind of mount that kind of an effort so one of the many benefits that that we received when uh terry scott joined our um, board of directors a little while ago and in addition to her scholarship and her wisdom um was um, the experience of the institute uh, for common power in conducting um, these kinds of trips and and so um it, it you know it's uh, this is their trip and so we're we're just excited to be able to offer it to to our community um <clears throat> and you know they they have um and we'll learn tonight um what what's involved in in uh, and the many um resources that they they bring to this task um but one of the things that you know is is great for us also is that it offers us a way to you know kind of dip our toe into the into the waters um and and learn uh, along with you and uh, hopefully um evolve so um, you know, our primary interest is in, in creating a meaningful experience for our community. And um, so I, I encourage everyone to let us know how this appears to you. I think um, we may be sending out a, a a survey, I think, Amy Millen, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think that's going to be going out at some point. So we are anxious to know about um, what you think of of. Um, of this uh, presentation and this option. So with that, I'm uh, happy to turn and very honored to turn this over to uh, Dr. Terry Scott and David Domke uh, of the Institute for Common Power. Thank you so much, Will. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'm happy to say that I am also in Maryland and joining you from Frederick, Maryland this evening. So I see some folks from some border states as well. Um, I am Dr. Terri Ann Scott. I'm the director of the Institute for Common Power. I will give a much longer introduction in just a moment, but I wanted to give my colleague an opportunity to introduce himself as well. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is David Domke. I'm a former professor at the University of Washington, which is where Dr. Scott and I met uh, back in the mid 2010s. Before she made the very smart move to move to Maryland. Uh, we we had a great relationship and we've been fortunate to do these trips in one form or another um, for some time and then to begin to do them together about a year and a half ago. Really honored to have this possibility to share with you the work that we do. Thrilled to be part of the Institute for Common Power. Really uh, looking forward to the possibilities. We have done nine trips this year already um, as an organization and the level of interest in these is just off the charts mm -hmm. thanks david um yes we we just got back from one last week when we traveled with educators from 13 states and three countries and it was incredible and i say this because these are not my words but words that come from other individuals one of the things we hear most frequently is it's life-changing. People commit themselves to the work that they are doing. We call them our truth and purpose learning tours for a very specific reason that we'll talk about in just a moment. So as David noted, I am a former professor as well. I used to teach at the University of Washington, and then I moved here to teach at Hood College. I left that position at Hood College last summer as a professor of American and African-American history and chair of the history department to become the director of the Institute for Common Power. So the Institute itself, and we're gonna show you the overview of where we're gonna go this evening. I'll tell you a bit more about the Institute. Um, we have some guiding values that we'd like to talk about. I'll introduce the Institute and a bit more about the work that we do. And then we will go over a proposed itinerary and some of the logistics. And by the end of our conversation, we will have time for questions. 
from all of you because we want to hear from you. We want you to be able to ask questions. If you think about questions after this program, you can always email and ask as well. So we'll talk a bit about the Institute first. I left my position as a tenured faculty and I, I wanna say something about that so that it gives a better idea of the importance of the work that we are trying to do with others. Um, one in five PhDs get tenure over their lifetime. They call it the tenure lottery, a very close colleague of mine once referred to it as. Um, the number of black women who get that is even lower, under 3% of all tenured faculty are African-American women. I chose to leave that position, something that I have loved doing, it wasn't for a lack of loving, to teach in a different kind of way. The Institute for Common Power launched in June of 2022. It is the educational branch of Common Power. Common Power is a voting justice organization that was started by Dr. Dom Key about six years ago. And we wanted to have something that was educationally based so that people could understand the true history of this country and essentially pull back the curtains to see that truth and help them move into a future that involved creating change in our modern world. Our motto is education to action. And that is never more important than what we see right now. Because every day, and something just came out a few moments ago, every day we are seeing attacks on truth in places like Florida and Texas and other spaces. I am fortunate enough to live in Frederick County where FCPS has actually committed itself to teaching a full history of this country and they are making moves in that direction. That is not what's happening across this country. So we are committed to teaching the true history of this country and using that history to inspire people to create change. And so you see here with the Institute for Common Power, we break our work into four general groups. The general public, we are wholly committed to educators, we say that we want to create an army of educators to go on the front lines and teach children how to understand this history and also to be committed to anti-racism work. And we work with professional organizations like the Seattle Seahawks or the Washington Commanders and others. If you are a um, Baltimore fan, sorry, I like them too. Uh, we engage in that way in three different ways, movement learning, immediate application, and purposeful action. When we talk about movement learning, we find it very important to go to the places where history is made. And that's why we go. Next week, we are actually doing a teach-in in Florida to bring attention to what is happening in Florida with education. And we are going there as well. Movement learning is not only about going to those places, it is also about understanding and learning about the movements that preceded us like the movement for civil rights, the movement for abolitionism, the movement for suffrage, so that we can learn from those movements and apply them to the work that we are doing today. And so one of the ways that we apply that work is this journey that we are inviting all of you to go on with us. It is the Truth and Purpose Learning Tour for two reasons in truth. Number one, because we teach the truth. Number two, because of this attack on truth that is happening across the country. And it is the purpose because we seek to help people find their purpose. And if people have found their purpose, and I know so many people on this call have, because you are all involved in different forms of work that is doing good in the community across the state, then we seek to help you sustain that work. That work can be taxing. And we create a community of like-minded other individuals who are working to create a better world. David? Thanks, Terry. Um, let's let's just kind of pause for a second here. I, I would like to just pause for a second here. And um, when when we started to create the Institute for Common Power about 18 months ago, when we started to envision it, we really had in mind a desire to create an organization that did education unencumbered by the structures and the restrictions that are, we saw coming very strongly towards public education in this country. Uh, we also wanted to do it in a way that allowed us to raise monies to support young people to participate in this work. So we, we are committed wholly to educating everybody and particularly to providing dollars and scholarship dollars to support um, younger people and their ability to participate in our work. So part of the contributions that you would be asked to pay for this is to support those individuals. Um, 
And that is truly essential because they're not getting that kind of civics education in their schools today. Mm. We uh we mm. we offer let's hang on a second here and see. There we go. We offer a whole range of material and uh we offer courses once a week right now. Dr. Hassan Jeffries of the Ohio State University is teaching about the modern civil rights era. That's a one-month set of courses. Dr. Terry just finished teaching a course on Reconstruction. Before that, she taught a course on slavery and enslavement. Um, I've taught a course recently um, on American voting rights and the struggle for voting in this country. We had someone in March in March who did a course upon the important role of women in American voting history. So we do a lot of courses. We do conversations across difference. We offer a particular kind of uh, entry point platform for people that are interested in uh, trying to get to college, but maybe don't have the resources to support them to get there that we call uh, Scholars in Motion. And then we do these things called the learning tours. And that's what we're here to talk. We're here talking about. And so, Terry, you just put out there two really, really big words, truth and purpose. And we would expect everybody on this call to kind of be a little skeptical of those words, because those are really big terms and concepts. But we have been fortunate to travel to the American South um, together and with hundreds with their ability to impact thousands upon thousands of people. And there is something profoundly unique about the struggle for civil rights, for racial justice, and for voting rights that, are, that is present in the places we go, Georgia and Atlanta. Um, and so we're excited to, to offer this as a possibility. I understand this is the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. And although I'm across the, the country in Seattle, Washington, um, I certainly can respect the uh, the kind of commitment that one makes to be part of that kind of an organization. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of this possibility. What I want to do is to move us into um, two really central elements of our organ of our work together. So you have a real sense of what Dr. Terry and I, how we come about this, um, and how we approach this. And what we might do upon if you embarked on this journey with us, we have four guiding values that structure our time with groups. Um, and we have found these have all emerged organically from our time together over our trips. They're values that provide what we call guardrails for the experience for everybody. Um, everybody's adults in the trips that we make. And at the same time, the intensity of the experience and the diversity of, a, of a backgrounds and knowledge levels has prompted us to kind of put into place four values that we think that we know serve us very well as kind of guiding North Stars for the trip. So we want to put them out here to, to you right now and then go into the itinerary. And our goal in this window of time is that you could emerge from it and decide whether or not this is the kind of experience you might be looking for. And we understand it might not be. Uh, we just want to be transparent with you and how we go about this. So we have four values. Dr. Terry is going to talk about the first two, and then I'm going to talk about the last two. Thank you, David. And before I talk about them, I want to say something about the journey. You could go to the South and visit many of these places on your own. You would not, you know, we offer something that is different. We offer the expertise. We have civil rights activists and heroes who travel with us the entire time. But we have these guiding values in place because we believe there's nothing like moving through this journey, this journey that is so full of so many varied emotions and importance. There's nothing like moving through it in community. You can go by yourself, but it will never be the kind of life-changing trip that it is when you go in community. And so these values guide our community along that journey. I'll do the yeah. first two and then David will do Sure, that. you know, Terry, maybe we could just give an example. Like I know, because I have friends, you have friends who say, I'd like to go to Montgomery, Alabama. Where should I go? What should I do? And we can say, you should go to the Equal Justice Initiative. And they're like, great, I'm gonna go to EJI. And we both know, that if they show up in Montgomery and go to EJI, 
without community, without prep, they're going to be flattened, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, we understand that we've been there, right? So we might as well at least be flattened together, okay, right. is the way we approach it. Yeah. Right. And process together and help each other understand how we translate those feelings into action and channel them in the proper way. Sure. And with that, the first one is growth and learning. Speaking of being flattened, often required discomfort. We know that at various points in the journey, people will be uncomfortable. The history can be uncomfortable to learn it, to understand it. I have been doing this for years and I still get uncomfortable thinking about it. But we urge people to lean into that discomfort because it is through leaning into that discomfort that you can grow and that you can understand how to take those feelings that can flatten you and not turn away from them, but turn them into something positive. So that's our first guiding value. Our second guiding value is embrace all, embrace that we all have incomplete knowledge. That is eminently important. So we are traveling now with this group who is from the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. When we talk about lynching, for instance, and we will spend time doing that. That is one of the things that I have studied for more than 20 years. When we talk about that, there will be people who come with us on this particular journey who know far more than others. There will be others who know nothing. And that applies to various things that we talk about, whether it's the freedom rides or enslavement or the domestic slave trade. And we are never there to shame anyone or to assume that anyone arrives with any knowledge. So when David and I move through this journey, when we meet with our experts on the ground, when we travel with our civil rights hero, nobody is ever made to feel like they should have known this already. We learn it together. Number three is the perspective, the kind of statement that space for learning and voices requires intentionality. Um, I have spent 23 years as a professor at the University of Washington before, like Terry, leaving the academy to do this work. And I've been a communication professor. I've studied the ways in which our communication patterns and practices and norms shape and impact how we get along with each other, how they shape American politics in particular, um, certainly how they shape our ability to learn and to teach. And one of the major pieces that I've learned over time is the importance of intentionality in our communications. That to go on a trip like this with the diversity of people that would be involved, we're talking about age diversity, we probably are talking about racial diversity as well, and we're likely talking about economic diversity as well, possibly political diversity, depending upon, I don't know you all, but I can bet on the first three for sure. And there's no possible way that we could, could kind of open up that space for everybody, for learning and for voices without a very intentional approach to this, to intentionality that starts all the way at the beginning of Dr. Terry saying to Will, hey, how about if we do an information session so that people have an idea of what this might be like? Um, and then after this, we would have a, if you decide to come, we'll have a pre-trip time together where we can talk about what it looks like and get to know each other to all the way to how we sit in circles when we sit in circles to making sure that people have similar amounts of time to talk if they wish to talk. There's a deep intentionality every step of the way for, for how we engaged. And as a, a white guy who has entered into interracial spaces a fair amount over the last 20 years, I know how important, I have come to learn how important it is to be intentional about how one arrives, how one participates, how one listens, and when we speak. So we'll be very intentional every step of the way um, and that includes the crafting of the itinerary and the kind of ordering of the itinerary that we'll suggest to you all. And then fourth, um, we, ha we have we have a a belief rooted in a lot of experiences. Um, not you know, not every one of us has been perfect, but that group experiences only work with collective respect and generosity. 
we have to come with an understanding, a belief, a belief that although we are unique individuals and we will arrive with our unique life experiences, that that we have a shared commitment to learning and to making this a better world, a more inclusive world. At Common Power, our vision, our pursuit is for a more just and inclusive democracy. Um, and so even though we're not going to always speak or see things exactly the same way, we have to have that collective respect towards each other, understanding that we're walking the same way towards the same direction, even if we're walking differently from one another, and be generous to each other. Um, it is a it is a truth that by about mm, six hours on the first day, into the first six hours on the first day, there is somebody on the trip who's going to annoy you, whoever you are. And uh, I'm a loud talker. So if like, I'll just tell you that like right up front. Um, and so I might be that person. Somebody else might be <laughs> something else. It's a guarantee that that's going to be there. And it's essential for us to look at each other and to say, hey, we're in this together. And even though right now we're I'm, I'm being annoyed or whatever, we have to recognize that we also are annoying others and we're all in this boat together. When we walk down Commerce Street in Montgomery on a world-class walking tour that Dr. Terry leads us on, that you cannot get anywhere else from anybody else, there are these quotes in the pavement, in uh, on Commerce Street, as we walk from the river towards uh, a, a slave market, and as we do that, there's a quote. There's various quotes, and one of them is from Dr. Martin Luther King, and he says, "We all might have arrived in different boats, but we're all in the same boat here now in America, and we better figure out how to row." And so the reality is that we're all in the same boat. And we got to be respectful and generous with each other. So these four values are values that we invoke all the time. We bring them up. We, we talk about them. When we're about to go into a difficult, very difficult space, we'll say, hey, let's remember the generosity that we have to each other and to lean into the discomfort that's likely going to happen in here. We just invoke these and we utilize these every step of the way. So... Um, if you if you purchase the ticket, I use that metaphorically, if you purchase the ticket to come with us, these are the values that Dr. Terry and I are going to constantly kind of like keep invoking. Okay, I'm going to uh, move us into our itinerary. And Terry and I will share presentation on this piece because <laughs> we love it so much that we're like, I want to present that part. I want to present this part. Um, but let me just start by saying that that rectangle there, which is, captures a good chunk of the American Southeast, um, is a part of America, the United States of America, where there have been defining, uh, defining acts and progress and challenges in the fight for racial justice and equality. Uh, if you think, if you look at it from roughly the Atlantic Ocean to almost till you get to eastern Texas, uh, it is some of the most fertile growing soil in the world there. And that is that color of that soil, which is black because it's very nutri nutritious, um, gave that portion of the country its original name, the Black Belt. It was that soil, though, that was used to enslave people and then to put them into sharecropping. And so that really glorious thing that we got provided was used for evil purposes. Over time, because of the population that lives there and has stayed there, either because they didn't have economic choices or because they chose to, or because they've returned there, we now have the highest concentrations of African-American populations in various counties with this big band of counties all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to about Eastern Texas called the Black Belt. And it has a double meaning, both for the soil and for the population. And it's, an, it's a term that's used widely across the American South to refer to that area. It is also that area of the country 
that has produced uh, what most people would think of as the most iconic, uh, important moments of progress and coalition building and inspiration in the struggle for race and for voting justice in America. So we are going to focus on that southeast part of this country because we think it uniquely teaches us uh, pieces that we can take back to our places and apply them. When Dr. King spoke at the at the March on Washington in 1963, he delivered his I Have a Dream speech, and then he said, you need to go back to your communities, back to your neighborhoods. And so that's where we get into our individualized action coming out of this trip. That's the Southeast kind of zeroed in on them. And those uh, black dots are the places that we will go to as part of our itinerary. They, they roughly approximate the population size there, Atlanta's, uh, as we'll talk, as we talk about on the very first day, uh, we think arguably the most important political and racial city in America uh, today, and the importance of starting in Atlanta has, because of historical and contemporary reasons. And so we would start our trip in Atlanta, spend time there walking on a, uh, a absolutely foundational street in the American history and story known as Auburn Avenue that uh, includes Ebenezer Baptist, where Dr. King ministered, where Reverend Raphael Warnock is the U.S. Senator from now, and goes all the way down past the Southern Christian Leadership Conference headquarters, the, form, the founding, founding uh, office of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, past the space where John Lewis is, is, there's a beautiful mural for John Lewis, Ella Baker mural, there's everything that we could just imagine on that walking tour there, and that's where we start. We we spent about a half day doing that on the Thursday of the trip, and then we uh, and at the close of that we meet with the Georgia poet laureate Hank Stewart, who meets with us and has performed at the highest levels of kind of civil rights leadership in this country, and he get, he spends always a good half hour to an hour with us, and shares a few poems, provides some inspiration. It's a wonderful close to our time there. We then depart Atlanta and we go west um, towards Birmingham, and we then carve, we then curve off and actually land that first night, and then every night in Montgomery. But we drive west out of Atlanta because we want to stop at the small dot there, just east of Birmingham, which is Anniston, Alabama. Anniston is where the Freedom Riders in 1961 their bus was firebomb they were almost killed um it's a national historic monument now dr terry and i uh find it extremely powerful for us as a group of interracial people to show up in anison and to think about the courage that was presented there before us and to think about our responsibilities today we then car curve south and end that night in montgomery and for the next several days for the rest of the trip until we return to atlanta we are based in Montgomery because there's an awful lot there. And then we will do these day, these kind of day excursions or half day excursions to Birmingham and to Selma. So I'll turn it to Terry. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to talk some about uh, Friday and Saturday and what that looks like. And it's there in Montgomery then that we will meet up with Mr. Bob Zellner, who was the first white field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and who still works with us. He knocked on doors in places like Texas just last year, trying to catalyze people and make sure that they go out and vote. And Mr. Charles Molden, who was actually in the third row and on Bloody Sunday, March 7th, as they walked over the bridge, he was number six in line, and he was involved in every single one of the three marches on the 7th, the 9th, and then on the 21st. If you watched the tribute uh, for Bloody Sunday just in March of this year, you will have seen Mr. Charles Molden because he was the one who introduced President Biden to the crowd. So he will be with us as well. And everywhere that we do go, as David was talking about, we meet with Hank Stewart. We meet with people who are firmly situated in that history and understand their role in creating a better world today. That's everywhere that we go. And so we tie the history to our modern world very, very intentionally. 
as David noted, we will be in Montgomery for each of those nights. So you won't switch hotels. Every night we will be there. On Friday, we will wake up and start the morning with a walking tour of the streets of Montgomery. It is incredible that Montgomery is still platted in the exact same way it was in the early mm -hmm. 1800s. And so we use this opportunity to not only talk about Montgomery's history and Alabama's history, but about African-American, which is all of our collective American history um, broadly. So we start at the river. We, will, we spend several hours doing a walking tour um, that runs from enslavement until the civil rights movement. And we end at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which was the only church that Dr. King pastored by himself there in Atlanta or in um, Montgomery. And you will hear, I lead the walking tour, but Dr. Domke comes in, Dr. Domke comes in and speaks, um, Bob Zellner speaks, Charles Molden speaks. And it is a very emotional um, and kind of an incredible tour that we all do collectively in community. And then on that day, we also will go to, many of you may have heard of the Mothers of Gynecology Memorial. And that was done by Michelle Browder, who is an African-American woman who is an artist. And Browder versus Gale was the Supreme Court case that ended the Montgomery bus boycott. Her great aunt was Aurelia Browder, who was the woman who was named in that case. We meet with her. We see the work that she is doing to undo the work of a Dr. Marion Sims, who was the father of gynecology, who experimented on enslaved Black women and girls without anesthesia. She is rewriting and rescripting that narrative. We go to the Alabama Montgomery, uh, Alabama State Capitol building, which is there in very close proximity to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And we look at what welcomes you to that building. We talk about the way that public history is presented and what we can do about it and the implication of the way that it is presented. And then we have a dinner in the evening. Every one of our dinners are these kind of cathartic moments. I noticed somebody put in the chat that you went through this and it did flatten you and it does. And we make sure that those dinners are moments of renewal and moments of community. On Saturday, we will begin the day watching a short documentary on lynching. And then we'll have a conversation with everybody who is there. I always say that there are two things that people ask most about, which they misunderstand the most. And I'm sure many of you have found this too. Lynching is one of them. Malcolm X is the other one. So we have a conversation about what lynching was, what lynching looks like today. We prepare the day for that because Saturday and the arc of this trip is a very challenging day. That's the day that we go to the Legacy Museum, the EJI. We will go to the National Memorial for lynching. We will go there that day. We'll try to meet. I have been working with them um, because they are using some of my research um, to add names, unfortunately, to the lynching memorial. So I've been working with the researchers there. We will try to meet with those researchers and learn more about the work that they are doing. And then we have some time in that afternoon because what we don't want is for you to never have a minute, if you are an introvert, to yourself or if you just simply need some time. So we build that in. But we build it in also with the option of making ourselves available so that if you want to continue to process one-on-one, -on -one, if you have additional questions, then you have the opportunity to work through that. And we end that day in Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Alabama. We will go to Tuskegee University. We'll talk some about the history. We'll walk the grounds. And then we will have dinner with, in just him and our group and his wife, an American hero and icon, Dr. Bernard Lafayette who was instrumental in planning the Selma campaign, who was truly a right-hand man of Dr. King, who was one of the original freedom riders. And he will talk to us about his experiences. He is an extraordinarily wise man. And it is a really incredible way to end a challenging day. Um, the, on schedules for Sunday, would be a trip to Birmingham in the morning and a trip to Selma, Alabama in the afternoon. We would love to put it on the table as a possibility that the organ that your organization might think about extending the trip one additional day to a Tuesday, uh, because it doesn't for it, it gives us the ability to not put those two days together. Um, and we've done both trips that return on Monday and trips that return on Tuesday. And the Monday, the, they're both incredible. The Monday is is packed and the Tuesday one is simply full. And they're they're both a lot, 
and intense and incredible, but there's a little bit more breathing room on a Tuesday. But whatever you all decide, um, we will get to Birmingham and we will get to Selma. And the reason we have to get to both is because the Children's Crusade in 1963 in Birmingham, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, the amazing leadership of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth uh, changed this country, pr prompted President Kennedy to put forward um, a set of perspectives about civil rights that he had not publicly articulated in his presidency, and he did, and he, he, he called on the Congress to adopt a civil rights bill, and that becomes eventually the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We will have the great fortune to meet with a, an incredible community leader in Birmingham, T. Marie King, who's in her early 40s and works at the intersection of the most radical activists in town um, and the most establishment-oriented individuals, including the police chief and the mayor in town. And she works with all of these people and is really respected for her approaches and she will talk about how she does that work and what's her kind of values in doing that work. If we extend the trip to a to a day, a di additional day, uh, we can also build in on that trip to Birmingham and an ability to go to a lynching site that e Equal Justice Initiative has worked with um, so, uh, Birmingham to commemorate. EJI does these incredible commemorations and they are spectacular. And they also are very challenging for communities. And so there's a lot to kind of think through and talk about there. And there's two of those sites in Birmingham that we would have time to, to be able to take in. But if we do just, you know, stick with the Monday, then we'll have chance to go to Kelly Ingram Park, which is where the, the young children face down the fire hoses and the police dogs. Um, it's the icon. It is a sacred space in the American fight for racial justice. In the afternoon on a, on that Sunday, we would drive to to Selma, Alabama, and Selma is a place that is the most iconic and to us at Common Power most foundational place in the fight for a fair and just democracy and for voting rights in America. It's there where, of course, they had three marches in 1965 that didn't come out of nowhere. They came out of decades upon decades of, of organizing and work. Um, and we will get a chance to learn about that and to spend time with not only Mr. Charles Malden, who was, who was part of all of those, but when he was 15 years old and then 17 years old over the course of that kind of window from 1963 to 1965, but also Miss Joanne Bland, who was 11 years old on Bloody Sunday and was one of the youngest marchers there. We'll have a chance to meet with her and she, people come from all over the world to meet with Miss Bland and to get a, an opportunity to learn from her. We'll get a chance to spend some time with her and we'd have dinner at a lovely local restaurant that really captures the kind of heartbeat of Selma. We would come back at the end of that to Montgomery that evening and the next morning we would have a chance to close our trip if it's Monday closing our trip um, and if if it's we've extended by day then it's Tuesday closing our trip but by going to the Southern Poverty Law Center Civil Rights Memorial. The Southern Poverty Law Center is also based in Montgomery and they have a, a really meaningful, moving public space that uh, that honors some martyrs in the civil rights movement and, and commits us forward in our fight for justice today. And it, it, we have found it to be a really uh, strong closing place for us as a group. We would then come back to Atlanta and be back in Atlanta, ready for people to take flights out either on Monday night or on Tuesday night, depending upon what you all decide. But we get back about 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and people can catch their flights out later that evening, that afternoon. One thing that Terry and I want to note is that there are these sites that we go to, but in the midst of these sites are located in a much larger, again, back to that rectangle set of iconic historic nation defining spaces 
that we will reference periodically because they connect. It is a web of connection. And every one of those yellow circles on the screen is just some of the ones from Nashville, Tennessee, both historically and the Nashville nonviolence movement to the fight today against gun violence and the expulsion of these two African-American young state legislators, Representatives Pearson and Jones. Or into Mississippi in Jackson and the racism today, or Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was murdered, or all the way over to Rock Hill, South Carolina, or to St. Augustine. All of these places inter interwove together um, and interweave together today in very meaningful ways. And so we will put our experience in the context of all of these locations as we go from the sit ins to the Freedom Riders to Freedom Summer of 1964, to Birmingham in 63, to Selma in 65. So this is a remarkable rectangle in the American kind of trajectory. It's a place that defines us as a nation. We wanna finish our little overview with some very specific details about what we're offering and would love to do with you all. We're based upon your interests as we understand it, that we're looking at the dates of October 26th to the 30th or one day longer this fall. People would arrive in Atlanta by 9 a.m. on the morning of the 26th. You can come in on the Wednesday night before, which we heartily recommend, uh, but feel free to come in that morning and we'll start that morning and then we'll be back at the airport there in Atlanta on the 30th. Uh, with flights for departure at 4.30 p.m. or later. The registration, as Terry has communicated it to, to me, as we've talked about it, is capped at 30 people, and it's first come, first serve, and the registration is going to open June 1st, 2023. Uh, I'll go through all of these, and then Terry, you come back and fix or up, you know, further elaborate on any of them. Okay. Um, participants will purchase their own airfares, so you would buy your own airfare and you would make a payment to Common Power for $2,500. That money covers speakers, museum fees, ground transportation, hotel rooms, breakfast, lunches, and dinners each day. And it assures that the costs that we put into this trip do not lead us to be at a loss for the trip. We are, we are this amount of money, $2,500, is actually the cost of the trip. Common Power makes no money on these trips, none whatsoever. We just seek to not make a loss on these. And lastly, participants are required to attend a single pre-trip two-hour meeting on Zoom, um, at which we go through a variety of important pieces, build out those values, introduce ourselves, and also start to do some serious learning. And we also provide a resource list of suggested readings, documentaries, and podcasts as part of what we would be happy to share with you all. Um, this is what we're honored to be able to present to you. Terry, what further thoughts do you have before we go to Q&A? Um, thank you, David, for presenting all of that. Um, in terms of how you can pay, we can, we can talk about that. I think we have June 1st, but you have until um, August 1st to make that decision. If you have any further mm. questions, please let us know and we are happy to answer them. And I just want to emphasize again that there is nothing like going in community. And I feel very honored to have been a part of this. It is one of the most important things that I do, not just professionally, that is in general in my life. These journeys are one of the most important and fulfilling things that I do. And so I do hope that you all will choose to go along with us on this journey. There's a reason why we have done so many um, this year. And we, as David noted, we just want to cover our costs. So these are not things that are generating income. We do these because we know how important they are. We arrived back from those, that tour last week with those educators. And from across the country and other countries, they are united. They are pl making plans to visit one another. They said that their lives have been changed. We watch it in real time. There were two, and I'll tell you this very quickly, on the second day, um, who are from New York. And one of them said, you know, uh, he and I, we work together at the school. We have been questioning 
Um, if we're going to leave, we've been questioning what we want to do, and we know that we found our purpose, that this is what we're supposed to do. That's the power of this journey. So if anyone, I, I think there are some questions in yeah, the chat. Okay. I'm writing down some things. We could start there, Terry. Um, okay. Joan says, can we get an itinerary info via email? Yep, that's the first thing I just wrote down is we can we can draft up that itinerary and get it to Will to send to whoever you, you however you wish to send. Um, where do you register, Gail S? That's actually a conversation for Terry and Will to figure out. We have the ability to set up a registration online that would allow you to register. Um, and so whether or not that's going to be the way to go will be decided. Uh, but it will either be an online payment or it will be send a check to Common Power. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim, Stephanie says, uh, are, can we have single rooms? That's what the price entails right now is single mm -hmm. rooms. Mm -hmm. um, Carol wants to know, are all the meals, entry fees, hotel, et cetera, included in the cost of the tour? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Next one's coming to you, Terry. How much yeah, walking? How much <laughs> okay. is expected. So the day that we do the most walking would be that Friday when we're doing the walking tour. And so I clock it out, I think each time about 8,000 steps, but there are plenty of places along the way we stop and we stop where there are benches and we sit and we stop for quite a long time. So we are very mindful that people have different levels of mobility and we accommodate for that. And when we get to the end of that walking tour, our bus driver literally kind of follows us along and we'll say, <laughs> we need you to pick us up at the, at the um, Capital and take some folks back to the hotel. And so he is with us, Sam. He travels with us every time. And so he makes sure to accommodate people's needs. I have a question that came directly to me about dietary restrictions. Can we accommodate them? We 100% accommodate them. We have people in our team at the Institute who will send you out a questionnaire, ask if you have any allergies, ask if you are gluten-free, ask if you are vegan, ask if you are vegetarian. We accommodate gluten-free, vegan, and vegetarian. We have actually integrated into the trip um, a vegan meal for everybody on a couple <laughs> of times. And I am not vegan. I adore eating meat. And I can say honestly that it's delicious. And so it is a, a Black woman-owned um, vegan restaurant in Atlanta that we now go to. We try as frequently as possible to use local Black-owned restaurants for all of our meals. Yeah, that restaurant, we should tell them, Terry. It's, it's, it's called Slutty Vegan. Not my words. <laughs> okay. That's the name of the restaurant. It's actually quite famous now, I think. <laughs> and every every entree they sell has got a sexual name to it. And so yes. we, we, we generally have gotten the one night stand. And it's really, really good. It's a great sandwich. It's terrific. Yeah. Um, so we try to start out, <laughs> we try to start out healthy and then yeah. just descend into the Southern cooking. All right. <laughs> uh, let me see another question, Terry, some more here. I'm going to, I want to come back to the physically demanding. Uh, so maybe you could just give a sense of for like Bob and for oh, Charles. Yeah. yeah. So Bob, um, the civil rights hero we travel with is 84 years old. And he stays right along with us. And so that gives you an idea of we, we accommodate people of all age ranges. We frequently have people who lack a little bit of mobility, who may be older individuals, and that has never been a problem. Bob and Charles Molden, who I believe is in his 70s, um, we make sure that everyone is comfortable. As I noted, we stop quite a bit. And that is the day that we walk the most. Any other day we're not doing, we do a walking tour when we get there to Atlanta, but the same thing, we have time to stop and we're actually not walking as much as we are in Montgomery. And on the demanding piece, there's, in addition to walking, there's also just the pace, the general pace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so generally what everybody should know if you purchase this ticket is that we're departing the hotels at 8, 8 a.m. roughly, 8 or 8.30 a.m. each morning. And we're on the move with stops for lunch and for dinner and dinner is usually a nice good resting piece but we're on the move and we're back at the hotel around 8 or 9 p.m each day it's a full full day and this is with us delivering like the bare bones minimum content 
to to have this experience there's so much more that we could even do but that that is a pacing that we find works really well respects people gives them a chance to get a good night's sleep um, but also respects the spaces and the people we meet with because it's it's a lot for them to to spend time with us too for many of them they are recounting and walking through parts of their lives they're glad to and honored to talk about but is also demanding and taxing for them with us mm -hmm. um how much is it are the dates fixed the dates themselves terry i believe are fixed as in Correct. terms of starting on the 26th okay yeah. But I don't know. I don't know about the ending date of the 30th or the 31st. That's something that is not, you know, it's up to you all. But if we were to add the additional date, it would be an additional $250 per person that because the bus itself is $2,500 a day uh, to get. So you just get, you know, the cost kind of run at about $250 a day per person um, af after a certain baseline of cost to begin with. So it would be about twenty-seven fifty a person to go if we add a date, uh, and we are fine with either of those. I personally prefer the additional day because it allows us to have more time to process and to think about going to Birmingham and to go to that lynching memorial that's there, um, and to go to Selma all by itself. But we do both ver versions, and they're both very powerful. Uh, Carol. Oh yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so there are we've been pretty good, especially most the folks here will be coming from the West Coast or East Coast. So there are so many flights running every morning, particularly if you're flying out of BWI, that it shouldn't be a problem. If one is canceled, somebody can jump on one. If you arrive at the airport at 9 30, um, we typically will wait, you know, a bit until 10 until we depart the airport. We have had only a handful of times where people have gotten there a bit later and we just get an Uber to go from the airport to where we are downtown. It's only about 20 minutes from the airport. In terms of flying back, we arrive at the airport no later than 2.45 typically. So we ask that people get flights that leave at about 4.30 or after five o'clock. And once again, same thing, because everybody is flying to the East Coast, if a flight is canceled, there are always additional flights that you can take, whether it's to Dulles or to Reagan or BWI. Um, working through the questions, and I see, Nancy, I see your hand up too. Amy says, is the extra day an option for some and not all? Uh, not really, because it's, it affects how we spend the Monday as well. So I'm sorry, the Sunday. So it's really uh, you you choose the group chooses or leadership chooses which one you want to yeah. go with. How long are the bus rides? Uh, it depend it varies. It not depends, but it varies. The longest bus ride is on the first day on Thursday, when we we go an hour and a half west from Atlanta to Anniston, Alabama. Then we're off the bus there for a couple hours, and then we're back on the bus for two more hours to get to Montgomery. Those are the longest. Uh, bus rides going into the trip and then coming back on the very last day when we ride back from Montgomery to Atlanta, we are on the bus for about 45 minutes, then we're off the bus for about a half hour, and then we have another hour and a half bus ride. So yeah. basically, we're talking about an hour and a half to two hours longest bus rides. We try to, as best as possible, pay attention to bathroom breaks, okay? it is It is usually a running thing all the way through. And so we try to pay attention to that uh, yeah. every step of the way. Will, I see what you noted about Halloween and somebody liked it. So it looks like there's a push for October 30th because the next day is Halloween. And somebody asked uh, if it's the 2,500 includes hotel and meals. Yes, theoretically, you could show up at the airport with not a dollar in your pocket and you wouldn't need any money for this journey. Because we, I mean, if you want to buy souvenirs and things, that's on your own. But we are covering breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And um, we also cover the hotel and transportation and we make sure to compensate every person who meets with us because we believe in compensating people fairly for their time. And so that includes all of that as well. Lo Lois asks, is the hotel identified for coming in on Wednesday the 25th? Yes, it, it will be. It is not currently at this moment, but we generally stay at one of two hotels right by the airport. Very easy to get to from the, from the airport. And we recommend it as a place to, to kind of convene. But what we do then is we get up in the morning and we go to the airport and we pick up all the rest of everybody who's, yeah. on, who's flying in that morning. 
Nancy, I see you have a question about lesser known civil rights participants. That is what we do extensively. Virginia Durr actually and Bob Zellner were good friends. It was in the Durr's law office that Bob Zellner ran outside in the fray when Freedom Riders in Montgomery were getting beaten to help save people. We talk about them. We talk about E.D. Nixon, Joanne Robinson, Fred Gray. His law offices are there actually in Tuskegee and he continues to practice law with his son at 93 years old. So we make it a point. There is something that, you know, there's a king centric uh, discovery and examination of the civil rights movement. And of course we talk about King. And of course we will see his home in Atlanta. And we also make the point throughout this journey that there are many people who are part of the civil rights movement. There are the foot soldiers that nobody talks about and we talk about them at every single step of this journey. Um. Let's see, there's a couple more things here. Um, are we staying at different hotels? We stay at uh, the same hotel in Montgomery, Alabama, all of the nights. If you fly in for the Wednesday night, then you obviously we have a hotel in Atlanta for that first night too, but we're at the same hotel. Uh, there's a couple different hotels in downtown Montgomery that we stay at. They're all of the quality of like a Doubletree or a Hampton Inn. That's the kind of quality. They either, they come with some kind of breakfast in the morning. Are there double rooms for couple, couples? Uh, there absolutely is. We would usually charge an additional fee on top of the 2,500 for a single room. Um, so what we're doing here is we've just flattened the fee for $2,500 for whether you're single or double. So there, there is, you can absolutely have a double, but the price is gonna be the same per, for every participant, $2,500. Are there written materials provided? Yes, we actually send out a course syllabus with suggested readings and not everybody wants to read. So we have podcasts and documentaries on that as well. All right, Nancy, you've been patiently waiting. Is there a question <clears throat> you have there? You're on mute right now. I'm considering taking the train. Um, mm. If I did that, I probably would come in the day before because the train from DC gets into Atlanta at 8.43 in the morning, and that's pretty tight if you're going to try and leave at 9, and trains sometimes are late. Um, so I could stay in the hotel that is at the airport and be there for the bus the next morning. Is that yep, how it works? Yep, you're exactly right. Yep, you're exactly okay, right. Okay, and, and coming back, um, I guess I would just take the you know, would it be possible for the bus to drop me at the train station after letting people out at the airport or not? Uh, we probably would not plan for that. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question is, I'm unclear about the registration process. It, is there going to be, a, are we going to be notified about yes. who, how, and where we register? Yes, you will receive um, before June 1st. So registration will open June 1st. Before that time, you will receive an email from Will that will give detailed information about how to register, how to remit payments. So everybody on this on this information session will get that email. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, got it. And before thank you. that, everybody, somebody's asking about the video so they can share it. First of all, thank you for sharing it with folks. And yes, the video will be sent to Will and he will send that out in the next couple of days. Carol asks about a specific payment plan. Um, we're not a big uh, uh, organization. So we generally just ask for payment when the time is for payment. However, we're also seeking always to, to make, to get to yes, to have people come instead of not being able to come so let's just say that there is one payment plan which is when the moment happens you pay in full except for circumstances that people might want to just privately connect with us on and we will be more than you know accommodating and reasonable about that but we'll try to keep it the same as we go and lois you got your hand up you got a question yes uh, someone had asked about the nationalist and i would like you to respond to that inquiry um oh, Sure. So they asked if we would um, talk at the SPLC about white nationalists. We talk about issues of white supremacy and white nationalism. No, but not the, the ones that exist now. 
yes, we talk about that throughout the journey. So, and then when we go to the SPLC, um, they, sometimes we have gone through with them for a presentation, sometimes we haven't. So what we can do indeed is have them talk specifically about the work that they are doing in tracking white nationalist groups as well. I, I hate, hate groups. Yeah, and I, I think we can't guarantee that, Terry, right? Yeah. We can't guarantee that. We'll be happy to ask them. They have their own schedules as well. And the people who can speak to us, they are in constant demand as well. So we, we can certainly ask them um, about that. But these are all trade-offs in terms of possibilities. So if, if that is a, a group desire, then let's make it happen. If it's an individualized kind of question, then that's the kind of thing that someone could peel off from the group at, while we're in Montgomery and set that up on their own to meet with the SPLC. Because they're just there's just so many possibilities for different things to focus on. But so the group will, our hope would be that you all, if you're interested, would take this back, assess, think about what you want to do on these pieces, and then you and Terry can, can talk it through. Let's see. Um, I don't know. Anything else, Terry or Will or... <laughs> we would stay here all night and talk with you yeah. all. About it. <laughs> Will, I think there there are a lot of things in there about an extra. Uh, well, that'll day. be we'll we'll include that in the survey, uh, in the that oh. we'll, we do. So we'll you know we're nothing. Well, I should I was going to say we're nothing if not a democracy, but I'm not so sure about that anymore. <laughs> um, I see that Susan, did you have your hand up there to ask a question, Susan Spock? I had um, put something in the chat that I didn't, I think, got missed. But um, what happens if we'd really like to do this, but that the weekend mm. that those dates don't work for us? Are you are there going to be other trips that we could join? And I think uh, again, a question for for Will and the board. But I think ideally, the idea would be with gauging interest, we do this trip and then we do another trip in twenty twenty four. Is that fair, Will, to say? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so is that, is, has everyone had their questions answered who had any tonight? I don't see any, um, <laughs> any additional. So I just want to thank you. Um, is there another question? I'm sorry, I missed it. Oh, no, I think Nancy was just inquiring about how we sustain it's a, it, that's a very kind and good question. And one of the things that, that maybe seems ironic, but going through the journey and seeing the impact on people actually allows us to go on more journeys. That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for, for doing Thank you everyone for, for attending. It was um, a wonderful and incredible session. Um, and I really appreciate um, you spending the time to help everyone understand what the what the uh, process is going to be and what the highlights yes. are. And we're really looking forward to it. I'm, I know I am, and uh, I think um, you know, you've certainly interested a lot of a lot of folks. And so um, you know where to find us if you have any other questions. And um, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks, David, and thanks, Terry, so much. <laughs>